We're moving on, people. This is our quick and dirty presentation of the television chapter, chapter 9. Television had two inventors. They did not work together, and they were very different people. Vladimir Zworkin was a great accomplished engineer, and he led a group of other engineers uh, with Westinghouse Labs. And Zworkin and his associates uh, developed an early picture tube. It was called the iconoscope. And, you know, I agree, you can't have much of a TV without a picture tube. As for Philo T. Farnsworth, he was perhaps the more intriguing person of the two. Farnsworth was, and this is a word that gets overused, but it applies here. Farnsworth was a genius. In 1922, eight years before Zworkin and his engineers made their breakthrough, Farnsworth, all by himself, uh, sketched out a thing that he called the image dissector. It was a way of creating radio with pictures. Years later, Farnsworth was awarded the patent on television. Let me say that again, the patent on television from the U.S. Patent Office, because it was determined that if he had been able to build his image dissector in 1922, it would have worked. So why didn't he build it in 1922? Well, at the time, Philo was 16 years old, and it was a project for his high school science class. Still a young man, Farnsworth moved to Los Angeles. Uh, it, it was a good assumption. Uh, this was a, the uh, center of the movie industry. He figured television would settle here, too. So he took an apartment in the Mid-Wilshire District, what we would recognize today as Koreatown, and he was an odd young man who worked alone and would bring wires and tubes into his apartment that always seemed to have the drapes closed. At one point, the LAPD raided his apartment, thinking he had some sort of illegal drug lab going. Now Farnsworth, for all his brilliance, or maybe because of his brilliance, was an extremely difficult fellow to get along with. Um, he wanted to be part of the beginnings of commercial television. NBC was the leading broadcaster. David Sarnoff, you may remember that name from the Music Box Memo, David Sarnoff eventually became the head of NBC. He found Farnsworth so difficult to deal with that uh, he, Sarnoff, ordered his engineers to figure out technological ways to get around Farnsworth's patents so that they wouldn't have to work with him. This picture uh, that you see on this slide of Farnsworth as a middle-aged man, I believe it was taken in the late 1950s when he was a guest on a game show called I've Got a Secret. His secret was that he was the inventor of television. None of the four celebrity panelists who were making their living in television could guess Philo Farnsworth's secret. He had grown that obscure. Let's talk about the beginning of broadcast television in Britain and then in the United States. By 1939, in Great Britain, commercial television programming began. And that's amazing. Britain was in the Second World War II, what was in the Second World War by, by 1939. And pretty soon they were being bombed nightly, but yet they continued on with commercial television. In the U.S., there was a more cautious approach. In 1939, the U.S., not yet in the Second World War. NBC, the broadcasting leader, they started experimental broadcasts, mostly with sets that were put in public places. Part of this was to test reaction to this new medium. By 1942, when the U.S. was in the Second World War, uh, the decision was made, uh, let's put television on hold until after the war was over. 
And you know what this did for the big radio broadcasters was it literally gave them years to think about what their strategy would be toward this exciting new medium. For reasons I really don't quite understand, uh, licensing of new TV stations uh, was suspended between 1948 and 52. Now, now that said, the Second World War was over. Yes, for part of that time, the U.S. was involved in the Korean conflict, but I don't think that would account for uh, why the licensing of new TV stations was suspended uh, during this period. But what I can tell you that the effect was uh, is that it left the center of the country, except for big cities, without television. One when we think about early television content, you know, one of the shows that you may run into from television uh, as it looked in the early and mid-1950s is the iconic situation comedy, I Love Lucy. Well, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz had some interesting ideas, at least interesting for 1952, about how to make a television show. Lucille Ball's background was in the movies. And in addition to that, she was something of a perfectionist personality. So in an era where radio executives who were used to doing radio live, in other words, one take in real time, Lucille Ball's movie background made her more comfortable with taking a scene over and over again until it was done right. Now, that said, uh, the sponsors didn't like it. They didn't like it because it drove up costs. I'm not sure Desi Arnaz was a great performer in front of the camera, but behind the camera, Desi Arnaz was a visionary. One of his revolutionary ideas was to not, not film I Love Lucy with one camera that would just zoom or pan to follow the action. He insisted on having three cameras shooting every scene from different angles. So then, when this episode would be edited together, the editor could simply pick the best camera angle. Furthermore, Desi Arnaz also uh, insisted that each episode of I Love Lucy be shot on movie-grade film and that it be stored in a climate-controlled vault as though it were a movie. In fact, Desi Arnaz called the episodes of, of I Love Lucy as being like little motion pictures. Again, the, the network and the sponsors, they didn't like this because it was, it was expensive. But this is where Desi Arnaz really had an insight um, before others in television had it. And that was, he imagined that people would want to see these episodes again sometime. In other words, he foresaw the rerun. I know it's kind of hard to believe that in the early days of television that... Uh, Broadcast executives hadn't thought of the rerun yet. Television news. In the early years of television, news was pretty much newspaper news. And what I mean by that is a newscaster who was, in those days, always a white male, the newscaster would take a collection of stories, maybe from the Associated Press or United Press International Newswires, would edit it up a little bit so that it would read a little bit better, and then simply read that paper script on the air. If there were any pictures to go with that story, it would typically be a still photo projected as a slide over the newsman's shoulder. 
television news began to gain in importance with the first ever televised presidential debate. And the candidates, looking back, were both sort of titans of their parties. Uh, the Republican candidate was Richard Nixon, who at that time was the sitting vice president. His Democratic challenger was the youthful John F. Kennedy of Massachusetts. It was a very close election. The two candidates took very differing views toward uh, uh, the first of these televised debates held in October of 1960. Mr. Nixon had some bad luck. Somebody had slammed a car door on his knee. The knee had become infected and he had to spend several days in the hospital. He got out of the hospital, uh, probably not fully recovered, uh, in time for the debate reasoning that he had missed several valuable days of campaigning. Mr. Nixon was out very early and spent a long, grueling day shaking hands and kissing babies and do all, doing all those politician things. And when he finally got to the television studio in the early evening, he was dead tired and he looked it. Uh, Senator Kennedy, on the other hand, uh, had, had heard that an estimated 70 million people would watch that debate on television. And Kennedy realized that was more people than he would ever meet in a lifetime of campaigning. And so he took the day off and arrived, as the expression goes, tanned, rested, and ready. During the debate, the two candidates uh, showed different behavior. Uh, Mr. Nixon, you would think, would have had the advantage because he had been a college debater, uh, Whittier, Whittier College. And Mr. Nixon uh, followed the rules of college debate. He looked at his opponent when he was addressing him. Mr. Kennedy, on the other hand, realized that where you really gained votes was looking straight into the camera and straight into the living rooms of America. The uh, polling that was done after that debate was really interesting. Uh, political scientists who have been asked to judge the content say that it's pretty even. They were both experienced, skilled politicians. Neither of them made any major mistakes. And so the content, pretty much a draw. Among the people who heard the debate, uh, the debate on the radio, Mr. Nixon was preferred by a slight margin. It is believed that uh, Mr. Nixon's deeper uh, voice and slower speech made him a little bit more understandable to the audience. Among the people who watched that same debate on television, however, uh, Senator Kennedy won by a large margin. By the way, uh, in the fall election, uh, it was very, very close. Uh, uh, Kennedy won the popular vote by one-tenth of one percent. Was this a presidential election that was decided by one candidate on one night figuring out how to properly use television? Maybe. President Kennedy was also uh, part of the moment in which television news truly grew up. It was Friday November 22, 1963. President Kennedy, who was quite popular and was beginning to look toward re-election, was doing a goodwill tour through Texas. In those days, Texas was a swing state. And so uh, he uh, President Kennedy and First Lady uh, Jacqueline Kennedy uh, they were visiting 
various cities in Texas to mostly adoring crowds. Well, on that Friday, uh, the Kennedys were to be paraded through downtown Dallas, uh, a motorcade, they called it, through uh, uh, the main business section of the city. And in that less uh, security-conscious era, uh, uh, the, the president was in the back of an open car, a Lincoln convertible with the top down. Well, as you know, that was the day that President Kennedy was assassinated. By who? Well, that's open to a lot of debate. But let's get to how television news plays into this. Um, Mr. Kennedy's campaign swing through Texas was not a national story, but it was a big local story. The president was in town. So the local broadcast media was covering that motorcade. The national news media, well, they were back in New York. When the shots rang out, the Associated Press immediately sent out a high-level uh, news advisory that shots had been fired at the president's motorcade. Then a few minutes later, there was another dispatch that said the president has been hit, he's been taken to Parkland Hospital, and the news just got more and more dire. First with the local Dallas television stations, and then pretty soon with uh, the national television news operations. You know, what I can tell you from someone who lived through that period, I was a little kid going to Los Feliz Elementary School, that that Friday and through the weekend, it was all Kennedy all the time. So TV news that had been used to 15-minute and CBS had just gone to a 30-minute newscast, now suddenly they were reporting on an incredibly dire story around the clock for days. And by all accounts, they did a very responsible and accurate job. Let's get into um, television today. And the way that I, that I do this in the chapter is I go from the older versions of what television is and generally go up toward the newer versions of what television is. So let's start with cable. Cable began in the 1960s simply as a way for people who happen to live in deep canyons or high up in the mountains or you know, places where you couldn't normally get a broadcast signal. Cable was simply a way to get local television channels to those folks. It was called Community Antenna Television, CAT. Pretty soon, the early cable operators realized they could get a lot more people signing up for their service if they carried more stations. So to put that in local context, let's say that it's 1970 and your grandparents had uh, a vacation cabin at Big Bear and uh, they would go off to their cabin for the weekend and your, your grandfather would, would uh, brag to co-workers on Monday morning that not only was he able to see all the Los Angeles stations at the cabin, he was also able to see the San Diego stations. So the first real growth spurt for cable came from just carrying more stations than people could get through broadcast. By the 1970s, there were some high-level experiments on how to uh, how how Americans would react if they could get many more stations on their TV dial than they were used to getting. In the 1970s, people in a big city like Los Angeles could maybe get oh 
nine TV stations, something like that. People in a mid-sized area might be able to get five stations. People in the countryside got less than that. In the 1970s, uh, the, the most famous, the most uh, uh, well-cited of these uh, experiments was the Q experiment in Columbus, Ohio. And in the mid-70s, people in this experiment got about 30 television stations. Doesn't sound like much today, but absolutely radical for, for back then. And so a lot of what we know today about broadcasters having to become narrow casters, you know, specializing in your content, uh, the beginnings of the long tail, you know, to some degree, uh, was learned through these wired nation experiments. In recent decades, uh, satellite has become a strong competitor to cable. And you know, uh, when, I, when I talk to students in class, some have a preference for satellite, some have a preference for cable. Of course, there's a growing number who have a preference for neither. And we will get to that at the end of the chapter when we talk about those who have so-called cut the cord. As for basic cable, it is not a business that is going to go away anytime soon, but the number of subscribers peaked 20 years ago. Let's talk about the beginning of modern cable television. In the early years of cable television, it was regulated by the Federal Communications Commission just about as tightly as broadcasters were regulated. Well, by the mid-1970s, it was determined that cable did not use the airwaves in the same way that broadcasting does. And so the FCC began to let cable develop its own business model. Uh, the FCC began to deregulate to some degree. In 1975, HBO kind of becomes the first modern cable station. Uh, the business model that they figure out is to develop a high quality programming stream and by satellite to send their feed to cable operators around the country. What makes this such a good business model is that it's a little bit like an email list. You know, once you have that email list with all the addresses in it, you can send that email out to a thousand people with the send button just as you can with one person. And the same thing was true uh, with HBO and their programming stream. It just scaled up beautifully. Ted Turner is an interesting fellow. Uh, he was the winner of the America's Cup yacht race. He bought and then sold the Atlanta Braves baseball team and Atlanta Hawks uh, basketball team. He was the founder of the Goodwill Games. He started CNN. He is the Turner behind Turner Classic Movies. He married and then divorced Jane Fonda. He's had quite a life. And he is also a pioneer in cable television. In 1970, in the early years when cable was figuring out just what it could do well, Ted Turner bought a station that didn't have a particularly impressive broadcast license. Channel 17 in Atlanta was only authorized to have a small transmitter by the FCC. And for that reason, it was destined, or so it seemed, to never have a big audience. This was right about the time that Turner was buying his Major League Baseball and NBA franchises. And you know, for professional sports like these, 
the television rights are really, really valuable. And so you would have imagined that Ted Turner would have sold those very valuable rights to a big station that was authorized to have a big transmitter that could reach a lot of people. But instead, Turner reserved those valuable rights for dinky little Channel 17 in Atlanta. What Ted Turner had up his sleeve was he did something very similar to what HBO did. Uh, Turner left the transmitter on so that folks around the Atlanta area could, uh, could see their basketball and baseball games and also TV reruns. This is where the beginnings of the Turner Classic Movies uh, starts. But the real big part of the business was to take that feed of baseball games, basketball games, and classic television and make that feed available to, to cable operators across the nation. Here, we will give you this feed um, so that you can have another station that you can give to your customers as basic cable. And hey, that helps the cable companies sign up a few more customers, right? What it does for Turner is that then he can start to sell national advertising around this little station. So in other words, when it was Channel 17 only in Atlanta, he would have been lucky to get an ad from the local used car dealer. But now that it's the super station going national, he can go after Chevrolet ads. A few years later, uh, uh, Ted Turner uh, becomes the founder of CNN, which stands for Cable News Network. And CNN is a real pioneer. Uh, they started what we now call the 24-hour news cycle. I was a journalism student uh, in 1980, and I remember that there were a lot of broadcast executives who were predicting that CNN would fail that you could not have a 24-hour-a-day uh, television news operation. Well, Ted Turner uh, proved the critics wrong. Let's talk about the VCR, which led to the DVD player, and how threatening that was to the movie and television industries. In the late 1970s, video cassette recorders uh, came into the marketplace. Now, I didn't have one because I was a young, broke college student. And as I recall, back then, a VCR cost about $2,000, which would be the equivalent of about three times that today, if not more. The movie studios really were frightened by the video cassette recorder. Uh, they liked the play button, but the record button terrified them. You know, the, uh, to the to the movie moguls, you know, the record button was like the pirating button. Now, the Supreme Court decided in 1984. Um, you know, what should happen. And in this 1984 Supreme Court decision, it was mostly on the side of the consumers, although, although the broadcasters and movie makers, they also got a little bit out of this decision, too. Um, the main part of the decision was the Supreme Court said, uh, dear viewers, you can record to, the, to your heart's content. You know, if there's a TV show you really like, feel free to record the episodes. If one of your favorite movies comes on TV, feel free to record it. But, but, the Supreme Court also said you cannot turn around and try to make money off those recordings. You know, only those who own the rights to that TV show or that movie can actually sell that TV show or movie. So that's what the movie makers and uh, 
television networks got out of it. Let's move on to satellite broadcasting. Well, the early satellite dishes were just absolutely enormous, and they were expensive, and they were ugly, and they took up a significant part of your backyard. And as a result, uh, satellite broadcasting got off to kind of a slow start. In more recent years, uh, the satellite dishes have become approximately the size of a pizza pan. They can fit into a window. And as a result of that, uh, DBS, Direct Satellite Broadcast Satellite, has become a, a very strong competitor to cable. Now that said, as cable subscriptions peaked in 2000, satellite subscriptions peaked in 2007. Now that said, as with cable, this is not a business that is going away. You know, as of 2015, there were still 33 million DBS subscribers, and that's still a very healthy customer base. Let's talk a little bit about how the television world changed in 2009. High definition television was first rolled out in Japan for the 1964 Olympics, which were held in Tokyo. And it was a great technological achievement by NHK, the national broadcaster uh, in Japan. Now that said, it was high definition analog television. Relatively speaking, the U.S. was quite late to the party, but when the U.S. finally did go to high-definition television, it was digital, and so perhaps it was worth the wait. Now, what do, what do we, the viewers, get out of high-definition television? Well, uh, most obviously, we get a, a clearer picture and better quality sound. Also, the television screen has been uh, refined. You know, the old television screen was a little more square. The high-definition television screen is a little more rectangular in the same format as movies. And what's good about that is now movies play more naturally over television. Uh, another thing that we get out of it is subdivisability. You know, as you well know, you can go to channel 5.001 and get the KTLA mainstream. And then if you go to 5.002, you get all weather or all traffic or something like that. In 2009, uh, analog TV broadcasts ended in the United States and digital began. And so during summer school in 2009, people who did not have an HD television or did not have a converter box on their old analog television, on one day in June, their TVs just went dark. Public television. It's 1967. Lyndon Johnson is in the White House. Uh, the U.S. economy is roaring. Congress has money to spend. President Johnson has a series of programs designed to uh, uh, uplift and improve the quality of life for the average American. He called it the Great Society. One of those Great Society programs was creating an American version of the British BBC. And so our uh, rival to the BBC was going to be PBS, the public broadcasting system. Well, sorry to say, PBS never truly did become uh, a real rival 
to the BBC. Uh, the, the first major hurdle for PBS uh, came shortly after the election of Ronald Reagan in, in 1980 and the uh, tax-cutting conservative uh, revolution that, uh, that he led. In his first term, President Reagan and his allies in Congress were successful in getting through deep cuts to PBS. Now, please note, the public broadcasters did not die. They merely stepped up their fundraising. And a little later, under the presidencies of uh, George H.W. Bush and then later Bill Clinton, uh, some of those cuts were restored. By the early 90s, Newt Gingrich, who you sometimes still see as a conservative commentator, Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House the job that Nancy Pelosi now has. And he tried to cut off all funding to PBS. Now his reasoning was that public broadcasting audience tends to be people of a little more education and therefore a little more income. And Newt Gingrich saw that as an elitist group and said, gee, you can pay for your elitist TV. Now, this effort failed, and more than anything, what saved PBS in the early 90s was Sesame Street. Parents really did not like the idea of messing around with Big Bird. So the outcome of all this is we have, in the United States, public television on the cheap. And, you know, there's good and bad about that. The, the, the good thing is uh, we have a, a credible um, public television broadcasting network that only gets about a third of its funding uh, uh, from government at all levels, uh, federal, state, local. Now, what's bad about it? Well, okay, who are the others who make up that other two-thirds of funding uh, for PBS? Well, they are viewers like you. You know, if you watch... Uh, a public television station, you know that every now and again they go into fundraising drives where they hit up the viewers for money. Uh, another place where they get their money from is from colleges and universities and charitable grants and foundation money and corporate money. Now, here's where the problem is. For a show to get on public television, it has a much better chance of getting on the air if it is a topic that some corporate funder likes. So think about that. That's a bit unfortunate. In fact, uh, you know, one of the types of shows that, that corporations really like to underwrite are nature documentaries, of which there are a lot on PBS. Apparently, oil companies really like to be donors to nature documentaries. They feel that it softens their anti-environmental image. In fact, this has happened so much that uh, some critics claim that PBS must stand for the petroleum broadcasting system. Others say, nah, it stands for primarily British shows. On to the famous Nielsen ratings. In any drama about the world of television, you see network executives running around obsessed with their TV show's rating. Well, what is that? Well, first off, let me say who this rating is uh, devised by. It is devised by the Nielsen Company, Nielsen Media Research. They have been measuring broadcast audiences since the days of network radio. Now, on to their famous rating system. So, imagine your favorite television show. Uh, it used to be easier to come up with a rating because we all agreed when that show would be on. Of course, today, people may see it 
at the time of its original airing, or a few days later, or a month later. The way that the Nielsen Company is devising the ratings now, and I'm going to use a hypothetical here, okay? My hypothetical is going to be um, uh, Game of Thrones, San Diego area market. This is going to make the hypothetical numbers easy. So, a recent episode of Game of Thrones. Maybe a hundred thousand households in the San Diego area had watched it within a week of its original airing date. We would divide that by the number of households with at least one functioning television in our greater San Diego market. And I'm going to make the executive decision that that is exactly um, a million households with TV. And so it'd be 100,000 divided by a million or a rating of 10% or 10. Now another number that comes out of the Nielsen Company that is equally important is the audience share. And that's a, a, a slightly different number. It's always higher than the rating. We are still looking at the number of households watching a program within a week of its original air date. All right, we still have 100,000 viewers for our TV show in the greater San Diego marketplace. Except now we're dividing it by something called TV Hut. That stands for Households Using Television, which means the number of households that had a television on during the original broadcast time of that TV show. So we'll say that of the million TV households in San Diego, that 500,000 had their televisions turned on. So now it is 100,000 viewers divided by 500,000 households or uh, an audience share of 20. Please note that shows that do well but are on at an out-of-the-way time, like a very late-night talk show, they can have a relatively modest rating, but a sky-high audience. Ralph Hansen likes to call the changes in television an earthquake in slow motion. So, what, what does he mean by that? Go well, all the way back to 1976. The average person in the United States would be able to tune in maybe seven channels. And so in that TV world where there were three legacy networks, CBS, NBC, and ABC, and then there were a few relatively weak independent stations. Back in 1976, the big three networks commanded about 90% of TV viewership. I mean, think about that. It was their own private little marketplace. By 1991, cable, basic cable, has made inroads into American television viewing. Look, the number of channels that people can access has gone up almost five-fold, from seven channels to 33 channels. Well, as you might imagine, some of those television stations are starting to slide a little ways down the long tail. As a result of that, the big three networks are now commanding about 60% of the viewers. Well, let's move it up another 20 years from that to 2011, and people have even more channels that they can watch. By 2011, generally speaking, cable stations had a stronger economic model than broadcast stations. Because broadcast stations, nearly all of their revenue was coming from, uh, from advertising. But cable stations, they could make money in two ways. They could make money not just from advertising, but also from charging uh, to, to have their station carried on a cable system. Please note that by 2011, the far-flung Disney media empire, the most profitable part of it was ESPN. 
So here is what makes cable and satellite the stronger economic model. And share. So why else is Ralph Hansen think that we have been witnessing an earthquake in slow motion in the world of television. Well, Reed Hastings uh, is to Netflix what Jeff Bezos is to Amazon, founder and CEO. And certainly Netflix is a huge power now in, in visual entertainment. He claims that Netflix is the first global TV network. Well, that's quite a claim. Netflix uh, video service is now available in more than 130 countries. So is it global? Well, I want to know who those other 35 or so countries are that don't get Netflix. But that said, it's a pretty good argument. Let's talk about historically who got to be on television? In the early decades of television, I'm, I'm sorry to say, television was not a very diverse place. Furthermore, it wasn't a very gender equitable place. Uh, adult women in the early decades of television were either wife and mother or perhaps if they were unmarried, they were widowed, or maybe they were portrayed as a sort of sad spinster-like character who sometimes was you know, played as a comedic uh, character. In the early years, television was very prudish, very conservative. And it wasn't the government. It wasn't really the FCC that was limiting what could be shown on television. It was the advertisers. The advertisers were concerned that if something offensive went out on a TV show that they sponsored, that the viewers would take it out on their toothpaste or coffee or car brand. For example, in early television, you could not say the word pregnant. In I Love Lucy, uh, the real-life pregnancy of Lucille Ball was coordinated with her character on the show, Lucy Ricardo. In real life, in the mid-1950s, Lucille Ball was pregnant with Desi Arnaz Jr. On the TV show, she was expecting little Ricky because the word pregnant was, well, considered to be a little too much for television audiences. Furthermore, it was something of a mystery as to how Lucy's character on the TV show came to be expecting a child. Because in those days, even young, healthy, married couples slept in separate beds. That was not the case in real life. It was only the case on television. In particular, decisions about how to handle young women on television were a little bit odd from our perspective today. I'll give you an example. Marlo Thomas had a very successful run on a situation comedy called That Girl, and Marlo Thomas played That Girl. In the show, her character was a young aspiring actress in New York, and a lot of the scripts were her going out on auditions for commercials and getting into weird adventures. This is a harmless enough show. On That Girl, Marlo Thomas's character had a boyfriend, Donald. The sponsors were very concerned about a young single woman living alone in the big city and having a boyfriend. The sponsors insisted that in any episode where Donald was shown coming over to that girl's apartment, that there had to be a little scene showing him leaving by the end of the episode. With the Mary Tyler Moore show, the original premise was that Mary Tyler Moore's character, Mary Richards, was to be a 35-year-old stay-at-home wife to a doctor who she had been married to 
since college. All of a sudden, her doctor husband came home one day and wanted her to a divorce. So the series begins with her as a newly divorced woman moving to a new city, taking a job in a television newsroom, and getting a lot of wacky friends in the process. Sponsors wouldn't go for it. Divorce was not something that you could make a comedy out of. Never mind that a few years earlier on a rival network, there had been a situation comedy called Hogan's Heroes. That was a situation comedy set in a Nazi prisoner of war camp. Somehow, you could make a situation comedy about Nazi prisoners of war, but not a divorced woman. Today, television has diversified in a number of ways. That said, not sure that the, the networks have uh, fully represented the, uh, uh, the full diversity of America. And sometimes progress is maddeningly slow. ABC's Scandal in 2012 was the first network show since the early 1970s to have an African-American uh, uh, woman as the lead character. And if you look back to the last slide, you will get a hint as to what the last network show was to have an African-American uh, uh, woman lead character. It would have been Diane Carroll in Julia on NBC. Now that said, we are living in a more inclusive era in some you know, pretty significant ways. 53 queer TV shows to stream on Netflix. I, you know, I, that not only is that diversity, I, I think it's also the power of the long tail. Let's uh, talk a little bit about Spanish language broadcasters. Univision is the fifth largest uh, broadcast network in the United States. Now, in a place like the greater Los Angeles area, where we have a very large Spanish-speaking population, I'm sure it rates higher than that. There are some forms of programming that simply travel well. Telenovelas are, are very strong cultural exports. Uh, I did a media note some years back about an Argentinian telenovela that had become a surprise hit in Israel, of all places. Well, not only have you had television for your whole life, even someone my age has been surrounded by television my whole life. So, Academics have researched for the last 60 years. What is television doing to us as individuals and as a society? Well, for one thing, we spend a lot of our time watching television. I mean, if you take the number of waking hours a person has, and you know you try to see well what percentage of those waking hours is watching television it turns out to be considerable when we talk about television now um, I did a media note that mentioned the three screens so one television screen that we look at today is um, what we would traditionally think of as a television a big monitor that is in the den or the living room or perhaps our bedroom. That's screen number one. Screen number two is our laptop or our desktop computer. Now where the real action seems to be now, as it is for so many things, is in that third screen, the smartphone or maybe the tablet. Children are oftentimes among the heaviest television watchers. 
according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, which is a very good source for surveys about American life. The Kaiser Family Foundation has found that children watch about four and a half hours a day of TV content. I mean, when you think about it, and you think about their, their, this is four and a half hours every day, including weekends, it is likely that the average American child watches more television than they spend hours in school. So, where is television now, and where is it going? Well, if you are very literal about watching about what watching television is, uh, I turn on my TV set, I go to my favorite channel, and I watch my favorite show. If that's your definition of television, television watching is slowly declining. Now that said, and I'm sure this is something that none of you will be surprised by, streamed video, you know, however you define it, YouTube, Netflix, you know, what have you, Hulu, it, it's increasing. I don't know if we're there yet or if we are nearly there, but convergence means coming together. Uh, we are at a point where I'm, I have a little bit of a hard time telling where television ends and internet video begins. Convergence is, maybe it isn't a meaningful difference. And so for that reason, just the very definition of television itself uh, is changing. I mean, you know, for, for those of you who are uh, uh, watching this PowerPoint uh, after watching my YouTube live channel, was I on television? I don't know. Cord cutters. You, students like you, are much more likely to be at the forefront of this phenomenon. Cord cutting refers to the increasing number of people who are apparently living long and happy lives without having to pay a cable or satellite service. Did you know that it is perfectly legal to buy a digital broadcast antenna? you can get high-definition broadcasts of all the local broadcast stations. Now, that said, you can't get the cable and satellite-only stations, but with a digital broadcast antenna, which usually doesn't cost too much money, you can get a considerable number of local stations, and that's one way to cut the cord. What I'm finding is quite popular among, among my students is streamed video, and the sources of that streamed video varies. So, uh, I would be happy if you got on the chat box and told me, how do you cut the cord? And that is the end of this chapter.